Gentlemen, <laughs> welcome back to the shop. This even tide, I'm a rectum fry, a grievous situation. Wherein, due to forces beyond our control, BC Hydro, we got the power, so you don't. Oh, it, oh fuck. We truncated our cargo cultist postmodern deconstructionism. Uh, we are going to finish up the bolter on these because we didn't actually get them apart to see how they chooched. I am admittedly reticent to cut these half in two on account of them costing me nearly 50 Canadian doll hairs. That's after tax doll hairs as well. <laughs> There's a day's wages sitting in here, incredibly. But we got to take them apart to understand how they work. Before we do that though, something extremely interesting. Now this has a single lip seal appears to be made of some sort of Delrin, ABS, PLA, something, but there is some softer butylene rubber and no seam in there, so they did a good job on molding that. Now this, the way this works is this, there's two layers, one on the outside, one on the inside. They're only touching at this very spot and in betwixt the two is a vacuum, nothing in there. Now this material, vaguely vaguely magnetic so that tells us this is very likely a 304 series means uh, lots of chromium some nickel and stuff in there but it's an austin um, if you recall i went on a nerdgasm about steel previously i'm going to talk about this type of stainless steel there's three types of stainless steel uh, austenitic ferritic and martensitic martensitic is for knives it gets very hard you can harden it. The 304 series is austenitic. Um, you can't harden it, but and it's not magnetic. The ferretic is magnetic, but look at this. This is super, super fucking interesting, man. Not magnetic, not magnetic. Very magnetic. Not magnetic at all. What is going on there? Let's get her cut apart and see. But well, we'll come to that. I need to do something prior, which is show you how effective having a vacuum in between two metals is for not transferring heat. So the only way you can transfer heat from the outside through the inside is it sinking through here and into here and also through IR infrared radiation going directly from this inner uh, outer wall to the inner wall through the vacuum through the vacuum of this thermos, which is not actually a thermos, but thermos has come to come to mean that that double wall vacuum thing. So I've got the thermocouple here. We're gonna torch the shit out of this. This will get red hot. Well, you'll see. And this will also demonstrate. Guys were asking why wouldn't you make this out of copper because it's very conductive and then you can cool it down. Yeti, you don't want copper because it transfers the heat too well. So the heat from the outside will go to the inside. Stainless steel is the perfect material for this because it is a terrible conductor. You see that's red hot there. And that is not even warm. Try doing that with aluminum, aluminum or copper. <laughs> You'll have a brand instantly. To the back side. Not even warm. Cool as a cucumber. And the inside here, 30 degrees. That's just above, well, what is it in the shop here? It's probably 25 at least. Look at that. Incredible. Now I won't speak for you, but this blows my fucking mind because we're gonna use a magnet to infer what is going on here at an atomic level. See magnetic, and we go to the heat affected zone. Non-magnetic.
That worked out well. <laughs> Bit of a meat hook abortion there, I, I hear you. The guy could fuck up sunshine. But we're in like sin now. Two interesting, really interesting things. Where's that capuchon go? La capote, la capote. This thing goes on like that. So that's that fancy bit. Just gets jammed on there. Friction fit. And this is really cool. Copper dipped. Dipped is maybe the wrong word because it infers a painting process. This is not a painting process. It's an electrochemical process. As a man firmly rooted in the Newtonian world, uh, the here and now of gears and simple machines and so forth, this is apostasy to me that they would copper coat this because copper coating it due to the electronegativity of the materials causes steel. When you copper clad something, it causes the steel to rust, corrode, faster. All you need to do is crack that little copper barrier and it rusts all to hell. So you never see this. At first glance, it looks as if they chinsed out because what would normally happen is they would take steel, they would copper flash coat it, then they would clad it with uh, nickel and then chrome to make it super shiny. And that would, you know, you would think that that would be the best for not allowing IR radiation to uh, get into this surface and heat it up. But, but, when we flip that on its head and think about it, if you recall the avalanche detector thing that we took apart, all that, that, that that's a, a radio beacon, and we took it all apart and inside everything was copper clad. Turns out copper is an excellent reflector of IR. Behold, the elusive Northern British Columbian Sam Squanch. Hola, como esta usted? <laughs> Supplies, now we know. And I don't know what the Jesus this thing is. There's a little nubbin in there. And uh, pff, no clue. We got to have a closer peek at that. What in the fuck snakes is that? Arrgh. Oh, this is gonna end badly. Never use your fingers when a tool will do this. Ah, what kind of new devilry is this? Is Trump turning our, our frogs gay? Is this some sort of tracking device? With the viewing film, diametrically magnetized neodymium, and we have a look at that. Not magnetic. Not magnetized and not magnetic. Oh, or maybe it is, or maybe it's, what, what is it, what is it? Fuck around. Okay, some sort of ferrite bead. It's gotta be security tracking. Wow, manufactured on the inside here, what the? F you know, I, I guess these are pricey items, so. They walk out of the store. It's inventory control, I'm assuming. Unless it's some sort of heat treating check or... Well, no, it can't be moisture ingress. It's... Yeah, it's got to be security. Weird. Now, in a full nerdgasm on the stainless steel, what's in here. Just go... In a previous video, I explained uh, just mild steels and tool steels very briefly. Truncated. I just go ahead and look at it. I'll have a little dihydrogen monoxide here. You don't don't do this at home, kids. The rusty pipes. I mean, they use this for paint thinner nowadays. So now that you looked at that video, you know that carbon is what makes steel hard. More carbon, more hard. That's the Martin site. It makes uh, needle-like structures and eliminates slip through grain boundaries. Okay. 
Anyway, go back and watch that if you want to learn about how carbon affects the hardness of steel and how it forms certain types of grains. Now, we're talking about stainless steel here. So what happens is, in stainless steel, we have chromium and nickel, and they get dissolved into the iron crystal matrix. Don't get freaked out. Stick around. I'm not your, your professor what's trying to make himself look smart or throwing shit at you. I, I had a really hard time understanding what was going on, so I got it figured out to where I know what's going on, so I think I can explain it in, in layman's terms to tell you what is going on with stainless steel. Recall. So, oui, ma jolie, qu'est-ce que tu veux? I apologize for the interruption, but I'm not sorry. Priority slats. But we find ourselves at the welder's blackboard with some soapstone. We're gonna go over this. Recall, in the previous video, all steel. We have uh, a phase diagram here, temperature and carbon content. Up here at temperature, and it doesn't have to be melted, it's solid here, we have the structure that is called austenite, gamma phase. It doesn't matter. As we drop in temperature here, we get ferrite. That's mild steel. Now, austenite has a face-centered cubic grain, uh, crystal structure, crystal lattice structure wherein it is a cube that has iron atoms at every face. So on every corner and every face has an iron atom. As it cools down, it changes its structure to body-centered cubic. So we get rid of the ones in every face and we have one smack dab in the middle of the cube. The FCC, austenite, is non-magnetic. Ferrite is magnetic. So what is happening is when we alloy this with nickel and chromium, that displaces one of these iron atoms in the matrix. So instead we have chromium. Now, as we come down in temperature, it doesn't change to ferrite. It doesn't change to this crystal structure. It stays in this face-centered cubic, which is non-magnetic. So by alloying it with nickel and chromium, we maintain this austenitic structure and it is non-magnetic. So what is happening that the austenite now is getting magnetic? How is that possible since it has this structure that is non-magnetic? Well, in the areas that are cold worked a lot, you know, the, the grain structure is moving back and forth. You're putting in a lot of energy. That's actually changing that FCC austenitic structure back into ferrite. So here we have a higher percentage of austenite. And down here, we're starting to get some ferrite, which is magnetic. Then when we heat it up and we quench it, we're bringing it back up, putting energy into it and changing the structure back into this FCC, which is non-magnetic. Now we understand the crystal structure, what's going on in this 300 series stainless steel, and cold working affects the magnetism. Does cold working affect the corrosion resistance? No, it doesn't, because it's a totally different mechanism that provides corrosion protection. And to start, we're gonna have a look at aluminum. What happens to Aluminium. Okay, so aluminum, when you first cut it, it oxidizes very rapidly, but it forms an impervious oxide layer, and that's it's the same stuff that's in sandpaper. Very hard and very, well, it's impervious to more oxygen, so more oxygen can't get in there to oxidize the base material. So what makes some materials rust oxidize, some, some metals rust oxidize, and others not. Whether or not a metal will corrode is dependent on two things. The first, it's got to be reactive. Gold, platinum, it doesn't care. It's right full of electrons. It's plenty happy. It doesn't want to interact with oxygen, nothing else. So it has to be reactive. And secondly, the oxide has to be 
a larger or smaller volume than the original crystal lattice. So when you start putting oxygens on this crystal lattice, it either has to be much bigger or a little bit smaller. So they call that ratio, it's a the pilling bed, bed's worth ratio. And for instance, this forms an oxide layer, aluminum, but it doesn't further corrode after it's formed that impervious layer. It has a PB, a pilling bed's worth ratio of one and a quarter. Okay, so that means that once it accepts some oxygen in there, the crystal lattice is only 1.25 times larger than the, the, the underlying material. So steel, when you get at, at ferrite, just regular mild steel, that has a PB ratio, iron oxide three, uh, of like two and a quarter, two, we'll say two. So what that means is the oxide is a lot bigger than the underlying material. It can't hold together and flakes off. There's too much stress there for it to attach itself to the base metal. So what happens if the PB ratio is less than one? The oxide is smaller crystal than the underlying metal. It's porous and that allows more oxygen to get in underneath it. So there's a Goldilocks effect there. The, the ratio of the underlying material to the oxide, you want that to be right around maximum like 1.5. As it happens, chromium and nickel, their oxides are 1.5 times larger in volume than the underlying crystal. And that is why when you put chromium and nickel in steel, it is corrosion resistant because when it corrodes, it forms an impervious layer that is not under so much mechanical strain, stress, that it flies off of there, sloughs off. Hold on now, you're saying to yourself, but this will corrode. For instance, in your barbecue, the, the burner is stainless steel 300 series and it corrodes like hell. Why is that? Well, there's still corrosion in this under certain conditions. And in your barbecue, you have oxygen and high heat. So instead of chromium oxide, which has a PB ratio of 1.6, now you get chromium oxide, three, four oxygens in there, three, four chromiums in that crystal lattice structure, totally different. It's a different beast altogether. And the PB ratio was more like four and a half. So that makes the chromium slough off because it can't hold on. It's, too, it's grown too big to stay in contact with the base metal, sloughs off. That's why, also there's another corrosion mechanism, uh, carbon pickup. So if this, if you pierce this impervious layer, cause it is a mechanical barrier. If you pierce this impervious layer with carbon or ferrite, regular steel, or um, salt, uh, chlorides. It will form a little tiny corrosion cell and you'll get corrosion. So that is why guys that have these that are getting uh, spots, corrosion spots, you've either pierced the impervious layer with a hot spark or with a screwdriver or with salt. And we're gonna test that. I'm gonna show you uh, exactly how that works. Now, chlorine. A little set of the tab, a little ferrite. Now for the right holy terror of solvents, dihydrogen monoxide. Had a little left over. It only takes so much of this at a time. Rub that in. <laughs> That's gonna set up a corrosion cell. You need this as an electrolyte to allow the electrons to form a, a circuit. 